Okay. Are you ready for this, Carlton? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, so, first of all, I, I just wanted to ask you how you're feeling today. I'm fine. I'm blessed. And tell me why you wanted to talk to me today. Well, you know, it's, it's far too much stuff um, that's going on that's not have not been reported. And you know, I'm an innocent person. Actual innocence should be, well, according to U.S. Supreme Court, you know, that's enough to get people off of death row. So my thing is that the message is not getting out. A lot of people are not going to courtrooms. They were reading stuff that's been edited, you know, in the papers and everything. And they get part of the story. Whereas I think that if people get the real story, you know, then we, we would have this problem. And what's the real story? Well, the real story is that um, from the very beginning, this thing has just been one-sided. From the very beginning, from the rest home, you know, you would never find another case like this where I had not one dime for an expert from the beginning while the state had everything they had at the taxpayer's expense. They had all of the money, all the experts they wanted, and they opposed every motion that we put in. Although the judge declared me indigent that I needed the money, but they would not give me the experts mm -hmm. from the beginning. Then they lied from the very beginning of the arrest because I had no idea what I was arrested for. That's why I'm smiling in the very first photo of people see me coming down the hall with the red sleeveless top on. They think I've lost my mind because I'm accused of these cases, but I'm smiling. Well, I'm smiling because I don't know I'm accused of these cases. I'm thinking it's because of the South Carolina when I have scouted for South Carolina. Right. Because up there, that was a big case, a so-called state bandit, a state house bandit case. So I had no idea. And that's why they lied, because I always told lawyers from the beginning, I said, they had a tape recorder in the car. He was on the back of the seat, and they were talking to me about it. The reason they lied about it, because the only thing that's on that tape is me talking about going back to South Carolina. They didn't mention anything about these lies, about I went to talk about the case, I don't need a lawyer. They did mention South Carolina, but that's all. That's why they don't play the tape. So all of these years, they lied about the tape until a recent hearing after Jack Martin, you know, was able to pull this out and Roe finally admitted, oh yes, that's right, I did have a tape in my pocket, but it was not on. Hmm. Well, if you look at it, they had already said from the beginning, we're not going to question this man. We're just going to pick him up from Albany, Georgia, and we're going to bring him back to the jailhouse, to the detective division or whatever, and then we'll talk, talk to him. Well, if you were not going to question me, why would you have a tape recorder in your pocket, and why would you not going to use that tape recorder? What was the point in that? Right. So I had been on cocaine, and they took pictures of the room. The police had watched me go to the store, and we went to the store and we purchased alcohol. I don't drink alcohol normally. So I had been on cocaine bench for a while. They found some cocaine in a female container of mine refrigerator over in Alabama. And I talked to the guy on the telephone, CID or somebody, and uh, he said, man, from what other people telling me, you're a different guy from what these people here telling me. So I said, well, look, that's my cocaine. So they know I've been on cocaine for like a week or so. So when I get arrested, I'm on this. And I had drank this beer. They took pictures of it in the room. So, but they were talking to me. So when I get back up in here, you know, they um, talking to me and I'm withdrawing. You know, I'm really withdrawing, so they don't put me in the car. But I promise you, my head was on the back of the thing back there. I didn't point out nothing. Those those places, those places were not integrated when I was growing up. My wife was from there. Those, those areas were not integrated at all. There's no way in the world I would be able to pick out each one of these houses where a single elderly white woman lived that's from an affluent family. There's no way I could do that, or nobody that's never been in those areas. Mm -hmm. So they lied about that. And think about this. If I was going to refuse to be recorded, well, why didn't they sign the so-called confession? Neither one of the police signed it. Neither one of them initially. They presented to the jury an unsigned, uninitial, something that somebody wrote down. They pared it down from 12 pages to three pages. What happened to the other pages that was missing now? And in the pared down version, they got pasted over. 
And if you get that version as Dr. DeClue did, and show what I allegedly said, as opposed to what they claim Jerome Lively said, there's no facts in what I allegedly said. They are saying that I said this was the house, but there's nothing there to say that was that box over in that corner, and that box was not there when we came into this house. But in his alleged statement, there's all kind of facts in there. So it's either that he did the case, or the police are lying. Because you never confessed to them. I'm sorry? You never confessed to them. I have not? Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. You know, I, I, we talked about South Carolina. We talked about the, the robberies I had in Albany, Georgia. We talked about the robberies I had in Columbus. I didn't find out what I was charged with until I got on the telephone, and I called my companion at the time in Augusta, Georgia, Jennifer Slater, who's from Columbus. I called her up. And I said, listen, I suppose I'll be back in South Carolina in a couple of days or so. And she said, no. She said, I said, what do you mean? And I said, get the lawyer. I'll be back in a couple of days. It's just a scoundrel to carry one year. And she said, no, they got you for murder. And I'd like to fell out. So that's why I also asked the police. I said, I mean, the lawyers, I said, get the detective division. Get the phone records from there. See what time I placed this call. Because before that time, they had me chained to a desk by my leg. And they had the lady that was arrested with me, Robin Odoms, they had her in another room somewhere. And they was threatening me that if I don't say this, she'll never see her child anymore. They gonna send her to prison. People well aware of these police tactics. This is nothing new, especially when it's unrecorded. Mm -hmm. You know? So then they wanna say they didn't have access to it. Okay, so yeah, we went out into, into the neighborhood, but they was pointing out. And then when you get to trial, they lie about uh, Sellers, Roe, and Borum did not know. But lo and behold, today, you know, as today we find out the stuff that's in the box. I got like 14 different documents where these guys was actively in the neighborhood questioning people about these cases. That sellers, and that's Roe, Roe's on the task force. Although Ryan Bill Smith get on the stand and tell these people that these people didn't know anything about these facts, that these facts had to come from me. But nobody's saying, well, let's look at these documents. Of the ones that's looking at the documents, they're just gliding over and casting cast to the side. You see? Mm -hmm. So after this thing, we go in the neighborhood, they bring me back, and they keep me chained. I can't call anybody unless it go through them. So they lock me in this, this room, and I'm on, like, this place in this, in this cell down there, in this room, in this jail, must County count jail. Then they come back later. So by this time, my mom and I got this lawyer come down so don't say anything. He called Joey's land and all that. They swept that under the rug. They took a sample from me, okay? They came back a couple of days later and took another sample. My question is, what happened to the first sample? They were saying that that was inadequate. Inadequate, why? But the lawyers had come and said, they were shouting. So you can let it go home. I said, what are you talking about? They said, because the stuff come back and you are secreted, it doesn't match you. That was, that was like the second day. Hmm. So that's why they took another sample. Nobody said, well, what happened to that sample? Okay, so from this time, we get up in there and this fool talking about, I told him something about I could tuck my toes under in a shoe. I wear a size 14, okay, but that night, I signed a consent to take the bare feet print. Even if I could put my foot in a small shoe, what would you say about the bare foot print? How could I make that smaller? Right. That's not possible. Okay, in some of them houses, when, when uh, my original lawyer would buzz him and ask them, say, is it usual that you take bare feet prints from suspects? And the answer was no. So well, why did y'all take these bare feet prints? You know the houses, I know this wooden house was one of them, and another house. So they had the bare foot and they had the shard print. They still come out the same way. So they lied about that. So here it is, allegedly, I agreed to talk for hours. I agreed for you to take hair, blood, semen, I mean, uh, uh, hair, blood, and saliva. I agreed to drive around in the neighborhood to point out all these houses to you. I agreed to do all of this, but when it comes down to recording the conversation, I said no. Now, what, where does that come from? And then, like I said, even if I said no, what about them? Why didn't they sign it? Who goes home and sit at the table hours later and write down or some kind of fictitious thing that they put down and come back and say that that's even John Land, the ex-senior judge, 
who had, was the judge original on this case, said he's never seen that before. You and your investigators, man, you'll never find another case like that. Who, who goes on to do that? You take that, that thing there, the statement. And so a couple of the cases came out of Garden City where they, they found out later that the police down there planted fingerprints and he got sentenced in Garden City, Georgia, down near Savannah. They said because he was tired, well, these police were tired. They said they had been looking for me for hours. They had not been asleep. They had all this political pressure on them to solve this case. I was not the first person that they falsely accused of that. So again, back to the liveness question. They said the GBI, not Carlton Garrett, the GBI said the hair matched liveness. The GBI said the non secretive status matched liveness. The GBI, the Columbus police, the DA, all of them said the statements that he allegedly gave confessing to Miller, confessing to Dynastine, confessing to Jackson, that those facts were facts. The police testified on the stand that we didn't say that, that Jerome Livers did tell us that. So again, what I said initially, it's got to be either he did tell them that or he did not tell them that. But one way or another, they are facts that the police acquiesced to. They said, that's true. So who's lying about that? Mm -hmm. And it could have been, if he said that later, and he could have went back upstairs, or wherever he was locked at, it could have dawned on him, you know, I've messed up. So then he could have been talking crazy. Well, yeah, I kidnapped Lindbergh, baby. Does that mean that it, originally he was not telling the truth? He could have been. Yeah. Okay, so then when we get back to all this other stuff, now we come down to the DNA and all this stuff. Now, how are you going to murder somebody and you people destroy the evidence? You took all this stuff out of these, out of these um, envelopes and everything. Carson Gary never refused to have anything tested. The state of Georgia did. They, they, they opposed us going to the Georgia Supreme Court. They opposed that thing to have DNA taken. They opposed that. After the Georgia Supreme Court approved that and got back to the Superior Court in Muscogee County, they opposed that. They opposed us getting any experts from the beginning. They opposed us getting any money for any of that stuff from the beginning. They opposed any of the testing from the beginning and during this time on the extraordinary motion. They opposed that. Then they said, well, we'll agree on this lab. It's not like Dr. Ham Pickney went in there and picked this stuff. Julius Slater went in there with him. They picked it. I didn't ever pick up a particular thing to be tested. I said, test it all. So they went in and picked that. And the Bodie Lab agreed on in court. We are ready now, Your Honor, is what the state said. So they went on and tested it. When it's come back in the middle of sample, it clearly does not match me. Now they want to say it's a secondary case, a case I'm not charged with. But at the same time, you want to bring the Donaldstein case that I'm not charged with, you want to push that ahead. That cannot be contaminated. But when the other samples come back that did not match me in the Thurman case, you want to say that this case was contaminated. Well, if it's contaminated for me, it could be contaminated against me. You know, and what they're telling the public is not the whole story. When the lady in the courtroom stood up from the Bodie lab, it was clear that all of the alleles did not match up. The alleles are the points when you're matching DNA, which I'm sure you guys as investigative reporters know all about that. So the, G, uh, the FBI, you know, I think they pushed for 15 to 21. If one of the alleles does not match, that simply means that it's not the person. Mm -hmm. You could have 20 alleles lined up if one or two does not match. According to them, not Carl and Gary's theory, but according to them, that means that it's not a match. So that's what happened in the courtroom. There was no confirmation match. And then the question came up, well, why is that? We don't know. When we went back, the envelopes were empty. Why was the envelope empty? You can't, if you're one side or the other can't use up all of the evidence and expect the other side just to take that as gospel because they said it came out this way because I assure you, had the defense done it, they would not have accepted it. They would have been crying just like we were saying, like, that's not fair. Right. And that's not what the law is. On exfoliation, you know, you're not supposed to use it. When that happened, it's an assumption that the side that's responsible for that is guilty. They're hiding something. Why that? They oppose everything. So that's not a confirmation on that. And then also, if that was a confirmation, what about the other seven to eight cases? They was in the done uh, uh, Cody's thing. 
So if it came back for that mistake, why didn't it come back for the rest of them? Right. So now, when they, they cry that, that's another excuse. It's an excuse of did we get to the bite mark, the mold. First and foremost, question, why would a regular dentist that has nothing to do with the Columbus Police Department, why would you go to that dentist to have him to hold these molds? Not one mold, but three molds. We only knew about the one until later when the guy testified in court. So why would a regular dentist not associated with the police department, oh, that's right, he best friends with Doug Pullen, who was his sister DA at that time, who's now was a judge until the Judicial Qualification Committee to come in and let him ease out the back door with his racist stuff. So somebody could answer that for me. Who does that? Do you think if I got a gun and a case, that was involved, I'm gonna take that gun and give it to Jessica Knoll to hold that. When I got the police department, they got a property room. I'm the DA, I got a safe down there. Why would I give this to a guy that's not even associated with the Columbus Police Department? Okay, all those moles are still missing. When we find this one mole, they run up to Atlanta and get Dr. Thomas David, the GBI guy. Well-known forensic odontologist, the only one in the state, at least at that time. He identified the unfortunate victims in Hurricane Katrina, the unfortunate victims in 9-11. They called him in to identify these people. He's been doing this for ages. When they go to him, they try to get him to say, well, look, he said, I can tell you what, I can look at the person's mouth, and I can tell you whether or not that's him because the teeth are that bad. He said, and if y'all go get a court order, we can take a cast of his mouth or a pressure or whatever, and then that'll substantiate it even more. So they asked him, look, would you, is there some way that if it excludes him, would you say something different? By the grace of God, Dr. Davis said, no, I'm not going to testify for that. So guess what? They didn't show no more. They did not come back to him. Dr. Davis said he did not even realize what was going on until he saw it in the paper, that they were trying to murder me up before. He said, well, how could they do that? They didn't come back and talk to me. Why not? You saw him out first. I didn't ask you to pick Dr. David. He worked for the GBI. He doesn't work for me. You chose him, but when that man has scruples and say, I'm not going to play this good old boy racist thing, and I'm not going to lie on this man, I'm not going to lie for him, I'm not going to lie against him. That's all I've ever asked. I don't want nobody lying for me. I could have had plenty of people to come up there and lie for me with alibis, and all kind of friends would have said I was here, I was there. Why did not do that? So now the other two moles are missing. They took the one mole around. When he take the this microscope, stereo microscope, which he enhances stuff, and he do that. That's what he do. He went to school for this stuff. And when he hit the court and he explained this to the judges, they questioning him. The judge have no experience, nothing to do with dumb stuff, medical or anything like that. He took over the hearing, land, just took over the entire hearing. The state didn't have to say anything. This is record stuff. He took over the hearing and questioned this man, and then they go back to the dentist. He said, well, are you a forensic dentist? He said, no, I'm just a plain dentist. Did you use a stereo microscope at the GBI crime lab? I did not. So you just look at the naked eye. See, yeah, I just took it above the breast. The question was, a person with teeth, how do you bite, how do you bite a breast without leaving a bite mark above and below? How do you do that? That's not possible, I don't think. So he said, I used a stereo microscope, and that's what he shows right here. But he had already told them that before he used that. He says his lower teeth right here, and one of those teeth were rotated. To correct a rotated tooth, I asked the dentist here, Dr. Barron, how would you do that? You had to take that tooth out to put you put braces on there straight at He said, no, that whole thing would have to be removed. So then they lied, the reason they didn't turn over, Bill Smith and his crew lied and said, because I had expenses. Dental work done. My wife and people, we have these lab reports, uh, uh, affidavits on these people. You would not see expenses nowhere in there. That man said he, he put on a cap, a crown. That's just a cement job. Because the gold, the, the dental gold crown that was lost, he just made another and it just slide on. He didn't have to do no drilling. He didn't have to do any of that. So that was nothing anywhere to say anything about expensive dental work was done on my mouth. Nowhere. And that's what the report say. Back to the hair, my sample, number one, and it was, I think I told you that I sent to you, 
number 190 and 191 here in pubic hair from the GBI crime lab stated straight up insufficient select similarities and they explain what that means they don't say match non match at that time insufficient means just a no sufficient means just a yes and the other one just simply means we can't tell they said no on the half sample 191, but the lie is every one of his sample matched each one of the cases according again to the GPI, according to the Columbus police. So somebody's lying. It's not called the I didn't do the testing. They did the test. Mm-hmm. Then we go to the press allegedly. How is it initially that your famous people, David Rice, Hal Harris, half of your police department in this thing, they get these alleged prints? They test these prints against Carlton Gary's prints. They do not match. Fourteen months to two years later, GBI come down and they match. And then they want to lie and say, we agree to that, that Bud Seaman agreed to that in the court. No, Bud said, well, we're not arguing the print that they showed you might match him, but where did that print come from? GBI said, I don't know. Did you know that Harold Harris and David Rice tried to match this print and it didn't match him? So no, we didn't know that. So do you know how old this is? Don't know that. Have you been to the crime scene? I have not. And from the crime scene, there's literally, right this minute, literally hundreds of prints that still unidentified. Who could they belong to? They excluded the victims. They excluded the friends. They excluded the family. It was workers, everybody didn't know, but still they unidentified. That's what George Keller said, the head guy that ran the ID division. Oh, I'm sorry. He was next to the head. You know why? Because the head guy was Eddie Florence, an African American. They took off every African American that worked in that department. They were their experts. They kept that department up on the latest stuff in ID. They kept them up on it. They took Andy Florence off of that. They took all the Hardaway off of that. They took the guy off of that, and they had filed a lawsuit against that same Columbus Police Department about their racist stuff. They filed a lawsuit, eight police, and after that, they started the African American Police Association in Columbus, Georgia. But they took a plane, they went to Washington, D.C., before the U.S. House of Congress, not called from the House of Congress, the U.S. House of Congress, and they brought that circuit up there. They put in the depth of the statistics and show clearly the Chattanooga Judicial Circuit is the most racist circuit in Columbus, in, in Georgia. That whole circuit. It's not what I'm saying. It's statistics that prove that. So, okay, we come back to that. And we say, well, how many points? So if it's seven points, nine points, or whatever. But who knew? Each print on a person have the average finger got 75 to 175 points. Don't listen to calls and Gary get the proof yourself. If all of the people, David Axball, all these people, they justify for the prosecution all of the time. They get all the books. Mike Mills and Teresa Day, I think I mentioned that to you in the letter, they put out this paper from Georgia State University. They tell in that paper how police plant prints Five New York State Police State Troopers got service to prison for plant prints. They got several guys up there that did it in over 40 cases of plant prints up in there. But the question still came up. Well, how many people in this courtroom you think could have the same number of points on a finger alike? The answer was, it might be everybody in here. You and I might share 15 of the very same points. Mm. We might share 20 of the very same points. We're not gonna share the whole print. Right. But then lo and behold, we find out later. And it's not a science, number one, and they proved at the last hearings and all that they brought this out. They have no standard. One examiner might say one point, that's that person. Another would say, well, I need 100 to one, that's that person. There's no standard. So you're going as a subjective, objective thing, what are we going by here? But also, as I told you with the DNA, and please check this out, just like with DNA, in fingerprint, they have an exclusionary rule. Never heard of it in my life. An exclusionary rule is the same with the DNA. It's not how many match, it's the ones that does not match. If it does not match, that person is excluded. 
while on the press, their favorite case was the Woodruff case. They said every testimony that you see, they pushed the fact at the point of entry. They even went beyond that and said it was found inside on the window sill at the point of entry. We have the crime lab reports, and I have it right here on this cart right this minute. The crime lab report came from George Keller, the same guy I talked about a minute ago, and the director, S.D. Wright, the director of that, they examined the scene. And guess what it says? No relations developed at the point of entry, none whatsoever. So these people purposely committed perjury. Bill Smith knew it was no press up. They had this, they had this, uh, the, the report. Pulley knew he had the report. Julia Slater knew the DA. She had the report. The Attorney General knew they had the report. But they allowed these people to continue to testify that my plan was found at the point of entry. And then when the weak palm print come up, we put this guy again on the stand. Has said, well, here's a report right here. Is this yours? Yes. Does that report, and, and defense is exhibit number two, does that report mention that print, period? Absolutely. A at all. Guess what the answer was? It's not even in the report. The lie came back that, well, the reason we didn't make a shot of it or whatever is because it was too weak. Well, if it was too weak then, how did it suddenly become strong? Because Bill Smith then said that that was the print? And they went further and said, we tested the point of entry. We tested the wooden screen to the, to the porch. We tested the a peppercorn can that somebody sprinkled to throw the dogs off. There are no prints. Absolutely none. But they've been allowed to perjure themselves all of these years and tell these lies that my prints were found at the point of entry. So when the public hear that, when they hear prints, you know, we watch TV. People automatically think that's a done deal. Mm -hmm. Nobody has ever said, well, you know, they were points from the print, not a whole print. And from the scenes, they took six full cards of fingerprints from the Diamondstein case. They took eight full cards of fingerprints from the Miller case. You take a while, guess is how many of those Max Carlton gave you. Points or whole prints from the Kofa case, from the Borum case, from all of these other houses, tell me how many of those prints match Carlton Gary. You know how many? Between zero and one, not none. How do you explain that? How do you do that? You know, you, you say, okay, you say you got them. Y'all got four cards up from the scene. On the board, on the clothes, everything else, but none of them match Carlton Gary. But you come back two years later and say that, oh, seven points match him. We don't know because you didn't give us no money to get an expert. We didn't have nobody to say, well, okay, even if seven did, everybody there could be seven. But if you did that, well, what about 75? And it could be 175. So what about that? No, no, no answer. And let's not forget, everybody almost to the person involved in this case, it is not a race card, as I told you in the letter. This is a fact. You all probably have that record, we do. The Big Eddie Club, the Columbus Country Club, excluded black people, always have. Every judge, follow Will, Bill Smith, Slaughter, you continue on down the line. Every one of those people belong to that club, one or the other, or both, each one of them. The DAs belong to the same racist clubs, the same people. And would add even more so, the victims, with the exception of two, Miss Thurman and Miss Scheibel, did not belong to the clubs. Every one of the rest of them did. Their men and their families, including the Swole family, who survived the unfortunate attack on her. Every one of them belonged to it. They know each other. They're friends. Every one of them belong to the same racist club. Is it racist? Is it me saying it? Let's go back to Congress. Let's go back to what Tyrone Brooks. When they settled on, when the Justice Department settled that lawsuit, the channel who should be just a circuit was in that. They declared the judgeships illegal. They were racist. So when they declared that, they just swept it up under the rug? Why didn't nobody attack that? Because if it had been the other way, they would have attacked it. 
Yes, you see they've done that. Well, we're going to have to change this thing up here because now the black people got the power to vote. Well, Kruger out of Macon, the representative still on the floor, and he used the N-word and said, well, we need to change it because we don't want them to have this kind of vote. The other judge I had, the very first judge I had, he got on the thing, he said his, his hero was Hitler. The best time in the day was when he went to Nuremberg and he spoke to Hitler. That's Robert Elliott that died. He fires the, the, the flag from the South. His boss is a Robin E. Lee. His hero is Hitler. He prays William Challey from the Mila Massacre that killed all the innocent people over there in Vietnam. And guess where he is? He lives in Columbus. William Challey. He runs BV Vic Jewelry Store down there. That's his hero. Well, the Vietnamese people were also minorities. They didn't care. They'd have been white folks. They'd have killed a hundred and some white people, two hundred people. They would have been all everywhere. But he was his hero also. Mm-hmm. So somebody, I'm just looking for somebody to tell me, why am I here? Footprint doesn't match. Hair does not match. Semen does not match. Bite arm does not match. Shoe size does not match. Nothing matches. So why am I here? Why are you here? Why are you there? Why did they choose you? Because I was not the first person. By the time they, they had put libraries out there, and I come along, and they looked and saw this case in New York, which is similar to the case as a kid. They looked and saw that, so it was easy to go from there. I had a record. You know, it was easy to do that, because number one, the community was thirsty for somebody, as you surely must know. Before live, they were saying that we got the guy. We think we got the guy. You know, they didn't have the guy. So you thought the community was just going to continue to sit by that? So then they wanted to build the case. But they filled it on what? And I just read the level circuit. The level circuit sat down there ruling. And the level circuit clearly said their case is weak. It's a weak case. The case weak. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the 11th Circuit said on page 20 of their ruling from November two, 2009. They said this, not me. So where's all this evidence that they have? Well, how you know? I don't know. <laughs> they okay. won't show us anything. Ma'am? I'm sorry? I said, I don't know. They won't show us anything. I said, why not? Um, yeah. they're, they're claiming uh-huh. that it's still... Uh, the case yeah. is still pending. Yeah, it's still pending, all right. But <laughs> any other time, they would have showed it to you. Because if it would work against me, I guarantee they would have showed it to you. Right. They would have showed it to you. There's no doubt about that. February 12, 2009, on page 22, the 11th Circuit said, quote, given the weakness of the state's evidence, that's what the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals says. So where's all this evidence? So if the if the case was so weak, why didn't they grant you a new trial? Well, because we got like-minded people. Who, who did it go before? We got like-minded people. I can I can give you a list of cases that you would have to compare. For instance, they said one guy that did the same thing. They said he can't be expected to know the law because he's a lay person. But with Carlton Gary, I'm expected to know the law. In other cases, the Georgia Supreme Court, other cases rule one piece of document was not turned over. They let these people go all the way down to Williams, the, the guy from Savannah that had the antique shop. They turned him loose. You'll find a plethora of cases like that. But when this case come along, it's a whole other story. So, oh, 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 I was going to say, do you mind if I ask him a quick question? Uh, oh, sorry. Sure. Sorry. I just the jumping oh, in here, Carlton. Oh, this oh, is. Oh, hold on a second. Hold on. on. This is along the lines of what he just said. Go ahead. Carlton, it's Brendan Keefe, the chief investigator that works with, with Jessica. Yes, sir. Yeah, right. so today the parole board hearing was the parole board hearing was closed. They didn't want <laughs> the public or the media in there. Okay. They didn't want the public or media in the parole board hearing. The DA okay. won't let us look at the case files from a 40-year-old case because it's still, quote-unquote, pending until you're dead, basically. Uh-huh. Uh, do you feel that all this is happening in the dark and that the, 
And why is this happening in the dark? Why don't they well, want the people to see what's going on if there's nothing wrong with the case? Thank you. Thank you. That, A, answer that question. But not only that, but listen to this. As my wife know, and I had a hearing in Judge Jordan K, I don't know anything about this. Nobody consulted me about filing anything. And this is what I want my wife to put out there tomorrow or today, or you guys put it out there. Before I went to the evidentiary hearing on the extraordinary motion, I was not contacted by the lawyer. Didn't nobody come down here to talk to me about that. I was promised when they discovered that box of stuff in Don Miller's attic, I was promised that we would do that, that that would be uh, brought about, and I found all these documents that said he was a guy, Gary Glenn Howard, that lived five steps behind Mrs. Woodruff's back door. They found stuff from her house underneath this house. His name has never showed up on a suspect list until we got these documents from the attic. I asked Jack, I said, look, we need to push this. If you let them get on that stand for three hours, then we got this stuff here now. We got the evidence to show that a uh, seller's lied about he didn't know anything about the community. He used the documents. We got the stuff to show that Eugene Romanoff confessed to four strangers in the case. Why didn't we talk to these people? So it's a whole bunch of that stuff. So it's, it's them. It's not Carlton Gary. Exactly. So understand this. I did not go. My wife is not there. She would have gone. My daughter's now would have gone to the areas. Nobody comes to, since I had this date on me, find out how many of them came down here to talk to me. So I filed a motion in Bus County about this to stay this. I filed a motion to John Land to uh, I'm sorry, Clay Land down there. I filed a motion to him. You know what I mean? I said, I, I'm sure that the defendant's got a right to have some say in how he's defended. And they got a case in the U.S. Supreme Court now out of Louisiana where, you know, Sotomayor and all the people say, hey, a person can talk themselves in the jail. They can talk themselves in the gas chamber, unfortunately. But that defendant got a right. So who's contact, who contacted me? And I've got no jack about this. I had a, I had a hearing in Judge Jordan's chambers about this very thing, communicating. And I'm not the only client. There's another client out here, Jefferson, the same way. Morris Jefferson. Who's talking to me? Tell me something. Don't just call me on the phone and say, well, we're going to put this off and all this other thing to another day or something like that. Tell me what's going on. Nobody's done that. So why do you think that they're coming up, absolutely they're coming up. From one of their boys or two of their boys, they're coming up beyond the racist thing. And anybody asked that question, that's exactly what we were saying. Why? Why not? If you if you the one got all this stuff, why didn't you test the stuff? Why you oppose it at every level? Why didn't you give me the money? You got a fair case, why didn't you do that? Why you lying and let people testify permanently? When you got the statement, Bill Smith also said, these people were brutally beaten. Well, we got the copies of the lab reports from the GBI. It doesn't say that. We got copies of it. Ask, contact Jenny Bullock. I think my wife got a copy of it, but if not, Jenny Bullock got a copy of it. And see what the lab reports say for yourself. See. So I have to ask you, you know, I don't know of any death row inmate or someone facing the death penalty who isn't going to claim some sort of either innocence or that the death penalty is the wrong sentence for their crime. Why well, should people listen to you? And because they're not listening to me. I have the documents. They're listening to Dr. Thomas Day for the GBI. They listen to the lab guy that worked for the police from California. They listen to the lab guy from Alabama. They listen to the Boulder Lab from Virginia. They listen to everybody but called the game, including the GBI. It's not me saying it. That's why they should, because it's not me talking. Other people might talk, but we have the documents. We got their reports. So it's not listening to me saying I'm answering everything, but it's the lab report. It's the facts. Exactly what he asked earlier, well, why would they do that? Why would they not come out there with these facts? Why would they oppose all this stuff? Exactly. That's my point. Why would they? Listen, can y'all can y'all stay here for a minute? Because these people are about to have a heart attack for me to go around this corner around here, and I can come back and call y'all in maybe five, ten minutes. Yeah, that's fine. 
Okay, let me go out here because they about to get on my nerve. You know what I mean? Okay. All right, I'll call y'all back in about five, ten minutes, so it shouldn't take that long. All right. We'll talk hey, to you soon. You on the phone? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> All right, I'll call you back in a few. Okay. I'm going to cut you short.